Hello everyone, this is Christina Jang from ITDP and welcome to our webinar today. Before we begin, there are a couple of things to note. Yes, this web webinar will be recorded and both the recording and PowerPoint will be available online within a week. To interact with me and our hosts today, please submit questions through the Q&A function, which is at the bottom or the top of your screen. We ask that you please refrain from using the chat box. I also encourage you to enter questions throughout today's presentation and it will not interrupt any of the hosts. Again, thank you for joining our webinar today titled Intermodal Integration, How Trans Jakarta Improve Urban Mobility. Jakarta, Indonesia received the 2020 STA Honorable Mention for expanding and improving its BRT system, Trans Jakarta. This system has doubled in ridership in less than three years, serving almost 1 million riders a day. Trans Jakarta integrated with the city's minibus services called Kopajas to greatly expand coverage and also improve pedestrian access and intermodality at transit stations to better serve the city's population. Um, and for our uh, presenter today, we have Yoga Adi Winarto, the acting CEO of Trans Jakarta. Formerly, he was the engineering and facility director of the system since August 2019. Also, prior to this role, he was the country director of ITDP Indonesia. During his 10 years at ITDP, he worked on public transport planning and operational demand management, pedestrian improvement, and also BRT operations. He was involved in planning and preparing the operation tender and contracting for opening of the last three BRT corridors in Jakarta. So now I can hand the presentation off to you, Yoga, and you can uh, begin your PowerPoint. All right, thanks, Christina. Um, let me see if I can share this. Uh, okay, let's see. All right, can you, um, can you see the screen? Yes, uh, I see it here. Uh, let me just see once it's full screen on your end. All right. So, all right. So, is it good? Um, not yet. Oh, here we go. Yep. It okay. Looks good on my end. Thank you. All right. So, good morning, afternoon, and evening, everyone. Um, so, my name is Yoga. Um, I'm currently the acting CEO of Transjakarta. Um, but also the, um, the director of um, uh, engineering and facilities in Trans Jakarta. Um, so this is really just um, a story on how Trans Jakarta for the last um, well we've we've been in the, in the system itself uh, we've been in operation for um, 16 years now. Um, in fact, the 15th of January um, last um, week was our um, 16th anniversary as a system. So I'm gonna tell you some, you know, just like share some, some story from Trans Jakarta, how it can basically um, improve the urban mobility and, and how it has improved the urban mobility in Jakarta. So this is just um, a brief um, information about Jakarta. So we are basically the capital of Indonesia um, with a population of 10 million um, point four uh, people. But um, as you can see that the area itself, I mean, the, the dark blue one in the center is the administrative um, um, city where, you know, 10.4 million people live. But the greater Jakarta area, um, which includes, you know, other, um, other uh, cities and also uh, municipalities, um, basically it's home for 27, well, almost 28 million people. Um, so just to you know, show you this, the scale of the, um, the, the, the population. Now, the story of the um, Trans Jakarta basically started um, in 2004, where before Trans Jakarta, you know, I mean, still in, in some, some part of the city, we still have the, um, you know, so like as you see on the left screen, um, the micro buses, you know, all this old, uh, what we call the Kopaja, which is, um, you know, the, the minibus um, runs in the sort of individual and also rent basis. And also you can see the, the top left um, is actual, well, it was actual um, condition of the, um, the, the, the system where one passenger there, you know, um, sits in the vehicle with 
spare tires inside. So I mean, that's basically to show you how, how bad it was um, before Transjakarta. So when it started at, uh, in 2004 as a BRT, it basically improves um, a lot of um, surfaces. So the story of the BRT, we started from the, so the, the, the picture on the left um, was the, the main road, um, like the main um, trunk line in Jakarta, where in 2004, they, they made it happen, um, taking one lane of the, BR, of the um, road space to become the BRT lane. And it was quite successful at that time, you know, like a lot of people and also it saves time. Um, but then, you know, but, you know, we didn't stop there. So after 15 years and now 16 years, actually, we have expanded to these services. So, so uh, first, I mean, we still focus on the BRT, but we do have also um, a lot of um, what we call the feeder, direct surface on non-BRT. So when we call the non-BRT, it's basically, you know, feeder where these buses, they don't actually run on the BR and on the corridor. So we call it like Metro Trans. Um, this is basically low floor. Whereas our BRT system, they basically have um, high floor, like many in Latin American um, cities. And then the, um, the center one, what we call the mini trans, is the, what we call the hybrid system, or you know, some people said a high direct service, where they can actually run on the BRT um, and then stops at the, um, like using the corridor, but they, they also run outside the corridor, like you know, beyond the corridor. So it allows people, um, it basically saves uh, transfer time, for people out, you know, from outside the corridor, they can go directly uh, to the BRT without having to transfer. And the, the next one is the, what we call the Royal Trans. That's pretty much the, what we call the premium service, where you know, the, 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 what we call the, um, the, the sofa, if you will, like the seats basically kind of like you know, thick and also quite um, leather, leather thick and everything. And it has Wi-Fi and all the sort of premium services. But it runs uh, basically from the um, neighboring area of Jakarta. And the last one is the, the, the newest service in our um, system, what we call the microtrans. And I will talk more about this microtrans um, service um, later on. So the, again, just to show you the, the, the timeline on the evolution itself, like we started as a trunk only in 2004. And still was until um, you know 2012, um, where we at that time we had um, 12 corridors, but all pretty much trunk line. So the buses basically run only at the the, the trunk corridor, you know, without um, having to go outside the corridor. So 2013, then we started to launch the direct service routes, the service that I mentioned before. You know, people basically can can go, you know, can hop on the bus from the left side door. And then when it goes to the BRT, then it can just connect, you know, uh, using the right hand door. Um, and that, that basically saves people, you know, time um, for them to transfer. Then in 2017, we started the, what we call the low floor surface or, you know, the non-BRT routes, um, which runs, you know, so this is actually quite significant because the non-BRT, um, they serve many of the area where they don't really, you know, they're not really served by the, um, the BRT, which runs on the, you know, the main road, but, you know, people living in the sort of like residential areas, you know, like the, the smaller road, but they don't have the corridor that can basically be served um, by these services. And in 2018, this is kind of like, so basically from 2017, it's kind of like a game changer where we start, you know, to sort of integrate and run the non-BRT services with the BRT combined. And 2018, then the integration with the microbus started. And that's kind of like, you know, another game changer where we allow people to use um, the, you know, to, to, the, the, what we call the Trans Jakarta services. So this is basically not a BRT anymore, but this is part of the Trans Jakarta services uh, where they, we put the, the reader cartilage um, inside the bus and they have to go, basically they don't have to pay, but they have to possess um, a card. So basically a cart, um, when, when you tap in on the bus, then now the micro bus, then it will kind of like record um, your journey, but it doesn't deduct any value at all. So basically it's kind of like a feeder service in, in any sense. And then in 2019, we just launched the, um, you know, like the, the, the micro bus with AC, but also the integration with the Metro, the light rail uh, that just started in 2019. So that's kind of like you know the whole sort of range of service that we provided. 
Um, and in terms of the network itself, I mean, you know, I mentioned about the direct surface and everything, but when you look at the image, that's basically how you see from the left, you know, to the right, hold the whole evolution. Um, so ITDP has been also um, playing a significant role in expanding these routes, um, even, you know, creating the, the sort of like a network map uh, where it doesn't, you know, it didn't exist before. So you can see from the left, that's basically just whole corridor. You can just like see one single line in this corridor. And then, you know, 20, 2011, um, then we started what we call the inter-corridor surfaces. So like corridor one, the buses can actually go um, to corridor six without having, you know, so basically the bus that moves, not the passenger that changed the corridor. Um, so you can see, you know, a couple of lines that have like a double or, you know, even like triple lines. So that means that that corridor are served by multiple um, sort of lines. But again, still, they kind of like still runs on the corridor only. So when you go on the uh, on the right, that's basically you know we have um, in terms of the number of corridors, the it, you know it basically didn't really um, change significantly from 2010 till 2015, even today. I mean, uh, in 2010 we had um, 10 corridors, and now we have 13 corridors. But in terms of the routes, you can see like how the routes kind of like expanded. So we have now 20, uh, 208, uh, 12 routes. I think actually this was the number um, last year. Now we have um, 244. Basically, you know, like we we basically ate um, at, at, at routes every month, like uh, even one or two routes. So um, I cannot really keep track on you know how many routes actually we're serving because it, it even um, it keep adding every um, every month. Um, and as a result, then the you know the expansion of the routes basically um, gives significant impact on the coverage itself. So you can see, I don't know if it um, if it shows or not the you know the the the, the light blue, um, dark blue, and the green um, background. But basically, that that shows how you know it changes from 2017 till last year, um, how the um, expansion of the um, surfaces. So this is basically an area of like 500 meters. Yeah, we. We, we, we initially we used the PNT, the, the passenger and the transit, where ITDP um, kind of like um, uh, launch. Um, this is basically one kilometer radius from the BRT station. But because many of the area that we serve are not actually the BRT station or BRT stops, like just your normal normal bus stop. So we use a, a proxy of 500 meters um, walking distance. So the coverage of the Trans Jakarta right now, basically 83% of total population of Jakarta is served by our service within 500 meter walking radius. Um, you know, in, in other words, like, you know, 8.3 out of 10 Jakarta residents have access to Trans Jakarta. And it, you know, in terms of the, the area itself, um, basically less than, than the population because of the density, um, you know, um, difference between area. So it only serves like 70%. Uh, but this, this, um, this year we have, a well, our target is to reach 90% of um, total population uh, within 500 meters walking radius. So you can see, you know, the detail of the, the, the routes itself. Um, so again, like still the, um, the BRT and the non, what we call the integrated non-BRT routes, um, or some people say it's direct service, that basically plays a significant amount. But also the micro bus feeder, which is um, 45. Again, 45 was the number, I think maybe a couple of months ago. Now it, it increased already to like 60 something. Um, Route. So I mean the, the micro bus feeder actually you know uh, really catch up uh, in terms of the um, the launch. So just to give you um, um, some background about the um, how, how we operate and also sort of like a simple business model if you will. So we are the um, a state well a city owned enterprise. So we um, own uh, by the uh, provincial city government, but we're kind of like, you know, we're, we're not, we're a non-government, but we're um, sort of like a semi-private. Um, and we do run the buses um, ourselves, but also we have a partnership with the private bus operators. So just to give you some clarity why, you know, we operate since 2004. Um, so the service itself, we started in 2004, but at that time it was managed uh, by the government. And then in 2014, then, you know, we, we decided, well, not we, but the government decided then the best way and, to, you know, to make it more effective and more efficient um, is to, create, you know, to transform the organization to become um, sort of like a, you know, a state-owned enterprise. Um, 
So, so that's why I mean, in terms of the the service, we uh, we 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 started the service long longer than um, we established the company. Um, the service itself, like it's very very cheap. It's only thirty cent um, dollar, and then um, and we also, as amended by the government, we provided a pre, a free service for segmented passengers. Um, so right now, it's actually about thirty percent of total passengers. Um, that includes, uh, which is the majority actually comes from the the microbus passengers, um, which is you know like that, that I mentioned before, like you tap in, but you know they we don't deduct the passengers um, fare, and also we 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 provided some special, um, well basically a free free service um, free card uh, for like you know the elderly and you know disabilities um, and, and many other um, sort of um, user group. Um, so going going to the uh, operator scheme and also the business model, we basically partnership. I mean, about roughly twenty five percent of the fleet running in Transjakarta are run by us, but the the rest are um, actually run by the operators. Where we we do have a contract, so we have a service contract and we pay per kilometer of travel. Um, and again, consists of like the big bus, the medium bus, micro bus operators. So when we call operators, um, it's kind of like divided between the like the private companies um, as normal like you know the li limited liabilities companies but also now um, especially for the medium bus and micro buses they actually run with cooperatives so you can see like this num the name of like Copa Millet you know Colamas, Comica that's kind of like the co you know in, in front of their name stands for the cooperatives or cooperasi in, in Indonesia so I mean they kind of like act as one sort of cooperative, but you know, have like so many members. So instead of us have a contract with individual members, so we basically have a contract with the cooperatives and then they kind of like run the contract um, between the cooperative and their members. So for example, this, um, the one that um, what we call the Koprasi Wahana Kalpika, uh, one of the biggest operators. Um, so they have, I think it's about like 5,000 members, if I'm not um, mistaken, but we still have, haven't really reached a contract with all those 5,000 5, members. We still have, um, so currently we only have um, maybe about, you know, 1,000 members that already joined with the Transjakarta. But again, we, we, we basically run a contract with the cooperatives, um, not directly with the, um, the, the vehicle owners or the members. And then just to give you some um, total fleet size. So again, this number is actually quite a peanut for the city as big as Jakarta, but again, I mean, right now, it's actually quite um, useful to, to cater the demand of the, um, the, the passengers. So we have like, um, you know, more than 3,500 um, uh, fleet where the biggest population, again, still the, the micro bus. And um, but, but you know the BRT and what we call the 12 meter buses, which is kind of like a big bus, um, and also the low end three that, that also plays a significant role of our fleet. So this I can kind of like a split between the operator's bus and also Transjakarta own bus, um, where we operate roughly about 25 percent of the total fleet running in the system. And this is now the kind of like I think. Well, maybe, you know, in terms of like the STA and everything, maybe this is like the Sustainable Transport Award. I'm, I'm guessing this is one of the reasons why we, you know, we get the honorable mention um, in 2020 um, STA. Probably, I don't know, maybe Christina can um, correct me. But the idea is that um, we basically started the integration, the whole um, concept, what we call the Jack Linko. Um, this is basically a city initiative to integrate from MRT to microbus. But again, I mean, since MRT or the metro, we only have like one corridor with um, 14 kilometer um, long, and the light rail is only like one corridor with six kilometer long. So the majority of this Jack Lingo is actually um, contributed by us. Um, so the idea is that make sure that, um, well, well, right now the Jack Lingo scheme. Um, only still work, you know, still still work only in um, in the road-based transport. So the fair scheme, for example, if you use this kind of like cart, the Jaffing Pole cart, then you can transfer at any bus system, um, you know, uh, for five thousand rupiah or like you know, uh, zero point three dollar, uh, sorry, cent. 
oh, sorry, 30 cent dollar in three hours. So for example, um, if you switch from the, let's say the, the, the medium bus and you suddenly change to the BRT, then you know a total cost of you will be like 5,000. But if you don't use the Jeffling for cart, then you pay 3,500 for the orange, you know, the mini trans one, the feeder one. And then you go, when you change to the BRT, then you have to pay again 3,500. And then you have, you know, and when you go outside the corridor and there's a Transjakarta low entry buses and non, non BRT and you tap and then, you know, then they will deduct you like 3,500. So that's why the Jacklinko scheme makes sure that whenever you change, you know, transfer between routes, between buses, between services like BRT, non BRT or the micro buses, the maximum um, amount of money that you have to pay is only 5,000 rupiah or 30 cent dollar uh, within three hours. That's kind of like the scheme that we are working now. So um, the next slide that I am going to uh, show is the, what exactly is the impact? So uh, of this kind of services. So, I mean, this is the, the correlation between number of corridors and annual passengers. So the blue line represent the annual passengers from 2004 till 2018. Um, and then um, the core, so as you can see, there's no correlation between the um, number of corridors and the annual passengers. Um, but if, um, if we kind of like plot against the, um, the number of routes operating, you can really see, you know, from 2015 till 2018, I mean, even 2019 numbers are still being sort of audited. Um, but the numbers actually like really significant. So like for example, 2018, the number is about um, less than 200 uh, million passengers per year, but um, 2019, we reached um, 200, 264 million um, passengers uh, in 2019 alone. So I mean, and again, the, the number of um, routes um, also were added significantly within um, between, uh, you know, within 2019. So really, this is basically showing that the, the, the increase of the routes uh, play a significant role in the increase of the ridership of the Trans Jakarta. So how, how we actually did it? Um, I mean, you know, we before, so the idea, I mean, one thing that we really um, did is to really modernize the fleet. So you can see that the, the fleet transformation before this Copa, like the, the left one, you know, the, the green, white, what we call the Copaja, they became the more modern, so become the, the, the blue and, and white um, mini buses on the right. And also, you know, the orange one, you know, the old fleet and everything, they kind of like, you know, being like, basically they, they were modernized in, uh, started in 2016. So, you know, air con and they stopped like, you know, um, and they, they run quite frequent and stops at designated um, stops. Um, but for the micro bus, um, the first step is for now is to ensure that they are basically part of the system. So the, what we call the, the, the previous system, um, the rent basis where they, they own individually, I mean, even the driver, basically they, they just spend rent, uh, pay rent to the owners. Um, so the owners they don't really care how, ma how many um, passengers that they carry, as long as they get a fixed amount of rate, uh, rent every day from the drivers. So with the sys contract, uh, with, with the contract system, then we basically ask the cooperatives and also the owner to pay the driver by salary. So they don't have to really wait for passengers, you know, to be full anymore. And they have, they, you know, they don't have to chase passengers. Basically, they run on timetable because I mean they're paid per kilometer basis. Um, but they have to make sure that you know every passengers get in, get on the bus, get on the micro buses, have to tap. So the biggest challenge for us right now is to ensure that the distribution of this, um, um, you know, smart card for all users. I mean, we do have some some kind of like you know promotional um, uh, events. But again, I mean, we have 24 million people within the Greater Jakarta. So obviously, you know, the, the penetration of this um, car distribution is not enough. <clears throat> and the last one, well, last part is just to show the, the, the non-BRT low entry. I mean, maybe for some of you in, um, in you know, the US or like Latin America or even like Europe, this is not really, um, um, this is pretty, pretty much normal. But, but, you know, for us, the low entry is actually quite significant to boost our image and, you know, branding. 
So just to give you some, you know, you know, why, why does it matter? I mean, you know, having this sort of integration for these micro buses. Um, I mean, before, you know, we, we, we with this kind of um, vehicles, like no proper stop, they can just like, you know, stop everywhere and they don't run on like timetable, no schedule whatsoever. And you have to wait for the vehicles to be very full. But then, you know, so sometimes at the terminus point or like at, at the starting point, you have to wait for like 15, 20 minutes before all the passengers get in. Um, and again, like, and that's no air con. Jakarta is pretty much humid. Um, so it's really hot to sit there for like, you know, 20 minutes without um, breeze or without any um, air. And the driver is, um, well, let's say, you know, audacious driver, they just, you know, basically they, 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 they will kill for uh, passengers, you know, to get passengers. So um, they, they basically running and you know, like speeding um, quite a lot. So then when we change the contract, um, you know, with the contract kilometer basis, and some of them already transformed to the, um, um, to aircon. So they basically run at bus stops. We even now have GPS installed, card reader, as well as the CCTV to monitor the performance of the, um, and also security of the, um, the vehicles. Um, they also, um, so this, the, 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 the vehicles on the right, um, is the new vehicle. Um, it's not yet ideal. Uh, it's still kind of like a mini bus, like a micro buses, but at least, you know, it's, it's aircon, you know, like at comfortable um, and also convenience for passengers. And the, the drivers, again, like they, basically when, when they go speeding, then the GPS can basically alert our command center and they can get uh, some penalty uh, when they, um, you know, when they submit their, um, their, their invoice to us, then, you know, we will basically deduct some of the um, uh, violence that they, um, they did. So why it really matters? Because they are the game changer. I mean, right now we have nine, um, 69 routes with 234,000 daily passengers. Um, so our um, daily passengers, um, we well, maximum, we kind of like less, just shy of 1 million uh, passengers per day. So like where 20, more than 20% um, of these uh, riders are basically contributed by the micro buses. So that's why they are really significant because they go to the area where we've never been before. Yes, it's kind of like Star Trek, but then, um, so this is the area where, um, you know, like a small, um, well, not alley, but like small road with like, you know, four or five meter wide road that they can just go in and they really, they, you can actually stop at in front of your um, house if you're lucky to have the bus stop in front of your house. I mean, really, it's, it's really convenient for passengers. They can just, um, yeah, they can basically take you um, from your doorstep to, you know, like the main road. Um, so that's why this is kind of like a favorite um, for many of the um, riders. Um, and the next sort of, um, you know, intervention or, you know, or innovation that we kind of like created is to have the integration, like physical integration between modes. Um, so the last one was the, um, it's actually the um, the BRT station with the metro uh, subway. So that's why you don't you don't really see where the subway is. And uh, the center one, the middle one, is the the light rail, um, which also is not really showing. But basically, this is you have to trust me that this is basically a, a light rail station and the BRT station connection. And the last one on the right is the um, the, the the integration um, between the BRT station and the commuter line station. So, I mean, this is kind of like the, um, you know, part of the integration that we did. Um, so the service integration is one thing, but the physical integration between modes are really something that we are now um, doing with uh, many transit operators. Um, just so, you know, showing um, small things. So, I mean, yes, you know, so for some of you um, who come from Belly Horizonte or Mexico City, please don't be offended with these um, figures because um, this basically we get it from the brtdata.org, but I mean, maybe some numbers are not um, really showing correctly, but what I wanna show is basically, when you look at Jakarta 2014, where the daily ridership is only 313,000 passengers, within five years, basically, you know, triple, um, you know, with almost um, 1 million uh, passengers per day. So. That's kind of like, you know, all the, the, this is basically the result of all the services uh, from the, you know, route expansion, service expansion, integration, microbuses sort of acquisition, as well as the um, integration with other modes. 
So, you know, this is basically a proof that having more roots and having more integration is really good for your system. And um, the last, well, not the last, but basically just, just to show you, you know, how the, you know, the increase of the ridership from 2015, when we started this sort of like direct surface and non-BRT up to now. So the highest figures that we are, you know, we have now is, um, you know, it's only like 1,000 uh, less than 1 million rider, uh, passengers. Um, but in average, we, we, do, we have um, about 850,000 passengers per day. So we're still pushing it. Like the idea is that for, well, the target for us is to have the average number by 1 million and then the, the maximum number um, reaching about like 1.5 million this year. And we are very confident to do it. Um, and then this is really, um, I don't know why this is not really showing perfectly, but basically this is, the, it, 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 it meant to say all of Transjakarta's um, fleet um, is to have to be electric by 2030. And this is how we will do it. So the transition plan will start basically, I mean, we this year we only plan to roughly between 60 to 100 um, fleet for the um, electric bus, um, which shows on the green part. Um, we, we're gonna do it sort of like a pilot, uh, pilot test, but from 2022 onwards, and then again, like next year, we will add more buses, but from 2022 onwards, then we will start, um, if there is a fleet replacement or fleet addition, all of the fleet replacement and addition will start using the electric. And then um, we will gradually phasing out the um, ICE, all the you know the diesel and the CNG uh, buses. Um, then it will basically finish by 2029. And the reason why, I mean, if you ask like, why you still have like you know 2028, why you still have like 100, 178 uh, diesel fleet, is because we that's basically um, the the contract that we have. So we, um, we have a, a contract. Uh, that started um, 2019 and it'll, it'll finish by 2028. So that's pretty much the last kind of like fleet that we will have on diesel buses. And then after that, then 29, 20, 20, sorry, 2029 and 2030, then um, um, all the fleet will have to be electric. And I guess that's pretty much from me and I'll, um, I'm happy to discuss further from you. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Yoga. Um, and I'll just put up my screen as a default. For our attendees, uh, we already have some questions submitted and you can continue to submit more throughout. Yoga, I am going to um, start from the top question here. And if you can open the Q&A box on your screen, you could read along with me. The first question it, here is, why hasn't some form of rail um, been implemented in Jakarta? And um, I guess what you can talk about are the uh, the decision to expand BRT um, and not implement rail throughout the city. All right, so, I mean, yeah, why hasn't, no, um, actually we do have the rail. So we, we the commuter rail exists um, longer than Transjakarta. Um, I mean, from, I don't know, maybe like from, from the, the like 1980s, they already have the commuter rail, but it doesn't really go, you know, sort of like inner city um, trip. It, it's not really captured that much. So then started in 2019, um, we opened one line of the Metro and also one line of the light rail. Um, but the story for actually, yeah, I, I forget about to mention about this. So the corridor, corridor one of the BRT actually overlap with the, um, the metro. And then, um, you know, when, when, the, when the metro was constructed, there was like some discussion, oh, should we, uh, should we um, you know, demolish the, the BRT? And it's, oh yeah, you should, you should, because, you know, we shouldn't have competing. But the, the funny thing is that you know, once the, um, the metro um, up and running, um, the metro riders, um, actually expected, uh, well, you know, basically um, um, higher than, than expected. And the BRT riders after the, um, especially on corridor one, after the Metro line one uh, is operated, also increase, um, you know, quite a lot. 
So it shows that you know combination between metro and buses offers sort of like a win-win situation if you do it right and if you really you know put the integration in mind. Um, so you know like so why we you know we we, we, we like it took us 15 years. Um, so the the plan for metro actually started also in 2004, but then why it took them like 15 years to you know to to um, construct and also open because. You know the financing. We we get the metro from the um, you know foreign loan and also the time of construction and everything. I mean, but then many people kind of like expect, you know skeptical that buses and metro can run all together, but actually they they do run pretty well, and it's kind of like a win-win situation for both. Um, I'm gonna jump ahead to the next um, question: the the difference between trunk-only routes and the inter-corridor routes. So the trunk only route, they, they just run, you know, like, for example, the block M quota, and they just like run block M quota, quota block M, like quarter one. But then once we started with the inter corridor, then it did allow for like quarter one buses from block M, for example, to then go, you know, like halfway off the corridor one, and then turn right, for example, to corridor two, you know, so then, so as I said before, it is the bus that move between corridors not the passengers. So the, the passengers stay on the bus and the, the, the buses basically, you know, continue moving, you know, within like uh, between corridors. So that, that, that really saves some time for passengers to transfer. And, um, and then we're still doing it now. I mean, yes, some people are, you know, still transferring, but at least, you know, it kind of like relieves some transfer spot um, on different corridors. Um, Paul Williams, are passengers boarding or complete trips? I'm not sure if I understand the question. Are passengers, why, why do we put the quotes? I don't understand. Uh, let me just go um, with um, Daniel. Um, have you considered using trolley buses to achieve your electric goals? Um, yes, we, we um, basically we considered any kind of um, uh, technology um, for this. Um, Wait, where's the question? It's gone. Anyway, yeah, the trolley bus for the um, for the whole um, uh, technology, the whole range of technology, and then we we got help from one of the um, uh, multilateral development bank um, to assess sort of like you know the, the sort of I wouldn't say a pre feasibility study, but just like sort of like a scoping, and they kind of like you know for the BRT, it's kind of like you know like a flash charging or ultra fast charging are kind of like considered. They did um, assess the um, uh, well, what they they call the trolley buses, but considering the um, the, the the complication of the uh, corridors. Oh, all right. I Christina told me that I have to pause, but I just want to complete one thing that um, you know the trolley buses itself um, will will play a significant uh, quite complicated um, you know operation because you know the buses have to run on corridor if the if there's a one bus kind of like blocking the um, the, the 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 lane. Then it will, um, you know, it will be difficult for the bus to move around. So, Christina, go back to you. Hi, Yoga. Um, I just thought it would be helpful if I bundled some questions together for you, um, sure. but you can read along with me. Um, so, we have a question here um, towards the middle for Mary. What has the impact been on car ownership and levels of congestion and commute times in Jakarta? Uh, well, I mean, TomTom Tom did this um, research that they said um, at least in 20, um, between 2018 and 2019, then the, the traffic decreased 8%. Um, but again, like we cannot really um, take the whole credit for all the, um, all that achievement. So, I mean, there's kind of like a, a combination between the metro, the, you know, the light rail, as well as the um, uh, Transjakarta. So yeah, that, that's the only data that, that we have on the, um, the, the level of congestion uh, by this, this sort of tom, tom data. Great, thank you so much, Yoga. The next question here is further down from Neil. Um, how did TransJakarta organize the fleet transition for uh, private operators? TransJakarta has specified fleet standards. So um, how did they go through the process to tender for vehicle suppliers so that all operators had to purchase from? Um, how are the fleet upgrades paid for? 
so there, there's some more specifics in that questions, but I think maybe first, if you could address the fleet transition, um, that would be very helpful. So yeah, we, we do have obviously specified the fleet standard. Um, so we have to, like it, it's kind of like a different scheme. So the first one for the, the medium bus and the big bus, so we have the specification and um, we, we did have the tender, but it is the operator who then eventually buy uh, the fleet. And we have to really approve the fleet before they sort of, you know, um, agree that we, before we made a contract. So basically um, they, they really list off the, you know, they're like, they will use, let's say, you know, Mercedes or like Scania or anything like that. Um, so we don't necessarily, you know, uh, say that, yeah, you have to use this um, brand, but we have the specification that they have to really follow. Um, so the fleet upgrades, um, so, yes, it is. So we, we, we don't necessarily um, uh, provide any, any loan uh, from us. So the, when, they, when we contract the operators, then they basically ask for financing. And we do have, a, you know, we, we actually get help a lot from um, commercial banks. I mean, all basically national bank and also our state owned bank. Um, so, you know, we, we kind of like negotiate, you know, the, 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 the rate um, for the financing um, and we kind of like with the contract, it's kind of like guaranteed. I mean, the, the, the difference between the before, um, very, you know, very few operators um, are able to access the bank financing. Most of them actually going through what we call the multi-finance or like leasing, where the, the, the rate, the interest rate is like almost double uh, than the bank's rate. So, but what with the contract, then, you know, they have like a guaranteed revenue. We even have kind of like um, some, you know, like some, some ideas that we can kind of like create an extra account uh, with the bank that, you know, they, we can like take, um, basically take some portion um, of the financing, you know, and then pay directly to the bank. I mean, right now it's not really being used, but then again, with the, with the contract that we have with the operators, that gives enough some sort of guarantees and confidence for the banks um, to finance the fleet. Great, thank you, Yoga. Um, the next question here is, what challenges has TransJakarta faced over time and how have they been addressed? Ooh, all right. <laughs> we will have all night, I guess. Um, but to, uh, to, uh, to, to just uh, summarize, I mean, obviously, yes, the, um, uh, maybe many of the um, cities also face for the BRT is really the violation of the, the private um, uh, vehicles. Motorcycles, you know, play significant um, mode share in Jakarta. And they're also, um, you know, the biggest um, violators on the lane. Like they, 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 they use the lanes and then also, you know, create congestion. Um, we, we did some, you know, um, some measures to kind of like counter, um, you know, counter that. Um, but for so far, it hasn't really been that effective. And so right now we're working with the traffic police to install like, you know, CCTVs and also using the electronic, um, electronic uh, tic uh, ticketing, well, not ticketing, um, what do you call it? Electronic um, enforcement um, to, to really uh, speed up the process and also, you know, take the police factor out of it, like take the, the, the human factor out of the um, enforcement. So just, you know, the system basically will report the number plate and everything, but it's still a work in progress um, for us. Yeah. All right, thank you, Yoga. Uh, the next question here is, what is the real full cost per passenger? What is the total amount of subsidies provided? Right. And does it come from the national budget? How is it provided to TransJakarta? So, um, unfortunately, we cannot really reveal the actual numbers for now um, because, you know, it has to be very accurate and I don't have the numbers with me. Um, but, it, but just to give you some indication that, um, you know, our fare that I mentioned, like, you know, 30 cent um, dollar, um, basically applied since 2006, if I'm not mistaken, and hasn't increased um, since then. So, like, you know, 13 years. And it's still like, I mean, inflation has gone up like crazy, but then, you know, this fair kind of like cap. So we actually quite, quite high in subsidy, uh, which is about, um, uh, I think 
60 or to 70 percent of our um, um, costs are subsidized. And it's subsidized by the city government or, you know, profit, what we call the provincial, which is basically Jakarta uh, city government. So, no, it doesn't, it doesn't come from the national budget. In fact, um, Transjakarta's um, construction, like investment costs, you know, construction and infrastructure, as well as the operation costs, 100% comes from the uh, city budget. I mean, the subsidy, sorry, the subsidy itself and also the investment costs. So no national uh, budget um, has been poured into Transjakarta uh, from the beginning. Thank you, Yoga. The next question here, I'm going to combine. Um, the first part is, was there resistance from private vehicle owners um, and how did Transjakarta manage and address them? And beyond that, are there any key takeaways and salient lessons from the industry transition process that you could share with us? Okay, so the first part, um, the resistance, obviously, yes. I mean, from the vehicle owners, it was it was maybe <clears throat> um, the, the beginnings when Transjakarta started. But um, why we made it happen? Because the mayor or the governor at that time um, was really strict. I mean, he yes, he came from the sort of ex-military background and really fierce, like he just like, I mean, he just said, yes, I like this idea. He went to Bogota and said, yeah, I want this. And then, you know, make it happen and that's it. And then, you know, um, so even like politicians or even like the national government at the time, kind of like rejects on the idea, um, you know, like called this idea like stupid and everything. But I mean, after 15 years, um, you know, the, the, the image of Transjakarta itself, like, like it's very, very improved. Um, we did have some kind of like a, you know, bad image back in maybe, in, you know, 2009 and 2012, where many of the buses, because of the poor man, you know, maintenance and everything, they kind of like, you know, caught on fire, like, you know, basically got burned. Um, but then, you know, over time, then we start improving the quality and that actually improves a lot on the perception of the people. And, and now it, it actually shows by, I mean, having good fleet is really good also to, to, to make sure that um, people, you know, get uh, a good perception of um, Transjakarta. Now I forget what the second question is. Well, was it about something transition again? It was the uh, key lessons and takeaways regarding the industry transition. So, wow, the key takeaways. Um, I mean, collaboration is really the key word here. I mean, this is really basically what we want. Um, so for the industry transition, we, especially for the mini buses, uh, the micro buses, um, we try as much as possible to, you know, to meet their, um, you know, demand, well, not demand, but like to meet their um, capacity. So for example, you know, my, the micro buses, um, only maybe less than 100 buses, uh, no, sorry, 100 vehicles are being transferred into the, um, converted into the, um, uh, the, the air con. Like many of them, like 1500 or 1600 of these vehicles are still, non air con and the reason is because we kind of like use their existing fleet um so obviously because finance is the, is one thing that um we still have to make sure um they, they can they can basically provide um so the, the takeaway is that we kind of like kind of like did it um gradually so we we don't you know basically force them to start okay getting you know you have to get this loan and everything low so if we contract with the uh, bus operator, like big bus operator, medium bus operator, they do have the capacity, you know, financing for like, you know, paying down payment and also, you know, getting the finance from the bank. But for the micro buses, it's kind of like difficult for them. So at least for now, we select the vehicles, um, you know, if they're uh, less than um, five years old, you know, with good quality and everything, then we ask them, okay, let's just, you know, maybe do a small fix on the, um, on the buses, on the, on the vehicles. Then you know, then we can enter into contract. And once they have you know some profit from the businesses, then we can ask them later on um, to finance the um, or upgrade um, their fleet. Great, thank you. Uh, great yoga, thank you. That was really helpful. Um, the next question here is, how do you suggest that other Indonesian cities can be patient in following Jakarta's footsteps? So it took Jakarta about 15 years to um, grow to the system that it has today. And how can this uh, 
be scalable in other cities and, and any recommendations that you may have? So the good thing about Transjakarta, now we, other cities can basically copy. I mean, we, we, we provided the proven business model. You know, we have all the, even like, you know, oh, what kind of specification? You don't have to create from start. Like you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You know, use like basically you can just replicate the, the, the system. Yes, I mean, in terms of the budget, Jakarta is kind of like giant um, compared to like, you know, other, because we are kind of like a city, but we are a provincial government. So a lot of money, um, you know, that, that, we, that we have. But for other cities that have maybe, you know, a tenth or like, you know, uh, a fifth of the Jakarta budget, they can start gradually with like, you know, they don't have to go with the big buses, start with sort of like a medium buses, go with the micro buses, because that's pretty much all the population of the public transport that they have. So, you know, work with them, you know, at least enter into partnership and contract. Um, and again, none of this, you have to really struggle, you know, how, how we do it. So Transjakarta, I mean, for us, we, we you know, we also provide like, you know, if, if any cities want to visit, not only in Jakarta, uh, in Indonesia, but also like Southeast Asia has been sort of, you know, like they, they've, they've visited us kind of like learn from the experience and we are happy really to share the experience. I think any, any cities that want to upgrade their public transport, they can really see what Transjakarta's, you know, um, experience and then they don't have to start from, you know, from the, like from scratch. We have everything, like we have, you know, the, the, the contract document, for example, specification, we do have the business model that they can really copy and we're happy to um, sort of guide them. So I, I guess that, that's really my answer on that. Great, thank you, Yoga. And to our attendees, we have we have about five more minutes left. So um, just to keep time for how many questions can be entered. The next question here is from Constant Yoga. Um, how do you get participation or feedback from passengers on existing and potential routes? And also how does Trans Jakarta decide on new routes and the type of bus to put on them? I'm, I'm trying to, which, from, from who? Constant. All right, let me see. I didn't really get the, those many questions. Sure. Participation ah, mm -hmm. of feedback from passengers. Um, okay, so, well, I mean, from, from the existing passengers, we, every year, we do um, what we call um, a passenger satisfaction survey. It's kind of like mandatory um, for us um, to, to, to do that. Um, but the potential passengers, yeah, this is really the tricky one. I mean, for now, um, the, 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 the modus operandi, if you will, is that the, we, the old buses, um, like for example, the, the, the old and you know, rusty buses, they actually run on routes. Like in, in the past, you know, they, so many people actually use that, 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 that routes. But then because of the fleet condition, you know, um, sort of like deteriorating and then, um, you know, people kind of like left the services, but the routes are still there. It's just not, not being popular anymore. So what we did, we tried to take on that route, like we kind of like, you know, like kind of like route acquisition with the new, you know, newer fleet, modern fleet, as well as um, timetable and more frequent, you know, good bus stop and good quality of buses. Then we tried to, you know, to, to rejuvenate that route and then um, uh, try to capture the sort of previous existing passengers. Um, and that's kind of like, you know, helpful in our, um, in our business. At least, you know, we have sort of like a lot, you know, good lot factors um, on that kind of like existing route. Um, now, the other thing is also on the, what we call the um, neighboring or like or inter, not intercity, but like um, the, the, uh, commuter trips, like commuter routes. So, you know, uh, we, we started the routes from the outside and then, then the outskirts of Jakarta, where many of the residential complex and, you know, real estate, um, you know, are, are located. And we tried to capture, you know, the, the movement from outside Jakarta to the sort of like CBDs and also center of Jakarta. Um, that's really how we create the routes. Um, and also, you know, like, and, and the bus, it's, we, we still have like, like limitation because the type of bus um, frequently, like normally is kind of like determined by the road condition. So if it's like, you know, quite small road and small, you know, um, small um, turning radius, 
then obviously we cannot really put like 12 meter or even like 18 meter buses. Um, so then, you know, like then we put the, what we call the mini buses. Uh, whereas the micro buses, um, they typically run on really, really small residential um, uh, roads um, where they, you know, they, they can really go. Um, and the challenges during the integration, I mean, with the existing transport operators, really, I mean, as I said before, yes, we do have a contract with the cooperatives, but one cooperatives have like, you know, 5,000 members. And it's really difficult for both us and the cooperative um, uh, to, to kind of like convince their members to, you know, to join. Um, because they have to, you know, see um, whether the business actually, um, you know, uh, profitable and also kind of like, you know, really um, like we, you know, to show them proof that this is really um, a profitable and good business for them. Um, is we are really struggling because they, they need to see other, other people too. So, um, and they cannot really just, you know, like they, they need to see their like, you know, so like maybe friends or like some, their, um, uh, their, their colleague who runs on this sort of like similar route. So we have to find the champion on each route um, for the existing um, existing players to be able for you know to 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 get them into the system. Great, thank you, Yoga. So um, I will just take one last question here, and then we'll wrap up the session. Um, the question is: What uh, pedestrian and cycling improvements have there been uh, with the integration, and also? Um, pedestrian access to the stops and stations? Uh, I mean, that's not within our mandate, but just to give um, some perspective, it's still, I mean, it's not the world-class yet. I mean, you know, um, ITDV actually has been working um, quite a lot with the city government, as well as the, um, uh, like, you know, the, the transport agencies and also the public works agencies to improve the, the connectivity. So um, on the main trunk, yes, we do have a, an excellent and also good quality you know, sidewalks. Um, we just started this sort of initiative um, to connect with the you know, bike lane and also infrastructure um, just last year. And the idea is to have like 500 um, kilometers of um, bicycle network uh, within the next you know, year or two. So really, uh, I mean, but, but I mean, at least, you know, the last two years has really seen the, the, the significant improvement on the um, uh, accessibility and as also like, you know, um, sidewalk um, facility um, on BRT as well as the, um, the metro and the other um, modes as well. Great, thank you, Yoga. So um, this is going to conclude our session today. And overall, I would just like to thank um, our, our attendees for joining and um, entering all their questions. And of course, thank you to you, Yoga, and your team for uh, putting together this great presentation and fostering great discussions today. As mentioned earlier, yes, this webinar was recorded and both the recording and PowerPoint will be made available to everyone on the ITDP website and will also be emailed to you by me. So thank you again, everyone, for joining and we hope to see you online again soon. Bye, Yoga. Thank Thanks, you. Yoga. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thanks for joining.